Jack Fetcher. He's from the Rochester Birding Association. Uh, he's going to give us a birding 101 workshop for us today. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Before I start, what I have to do is uh, get myself acclimated with uh, all of these nice things that they Louder. I've never had this before. I have to get real close. I understand that. I, I will do that. Okay, but I can't move it up, though. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. That works, okay. So uh, what I wanted to do first of all was it's a pleasure to be here tonight because I owe ADK uh, a lot. Uh, you afford me or used to afford me every year an, an opportunity to engage the general public that's interested in the outdoors. You might recognize that, right? So uh, I, I would have such a great time, and I was trying to get other people from the RBA interested in doing this, but during the course of the day, I would probably speak with uh, over 100 people with, regarding, with regard to their birding interest, and maybe some of them would join the RBA, but maybe not. In the meantime, I would have a good time talking to people and field a lot of really interesting questions, maybe half of which I could answer. So, uh, I am a member of the RBA, and part of my interest here is to get members. The Rochester Birding Association has about 350 members. We run, we have a monthly newsletter, we have monthly meetings, which have been Zoom for the past couple of years, but hopefully will be in person in the future. And we also run about 50 field trips during the year, all through the year. So winter is a pretty popular time for us to have field trips, believe it or not, because everything's different in winter than it is in summer. So, um, uh, let's see. So I've covered everything I've issued. I've given my introduction. I've been birding for about 35 years. So if that will intercept that question later. Um, so I think we can go on. And, uh, what I wanted to start with was uh, maybe just show you some birds that are familiar to you. Uh, starting clockwise from the upper left. So you have the robin. And then the crow, American crow. Northern Cardinal and the Blue Jay. You know, we, we all have seen those birds, right? And um, these birds here are probably familiar if you have a bird feeder. You know, the house sparrow and the downy woodpecker. Uh, down uh, at five o'clock, the black cap chickadee and then the uh, American goldfinch. Um, but some birds here that are probably unfamiliar to you. Now you won't find these at your bird feeder. You have to travel for these. You have to go to where the birds are. So I wanted to show you these and I wanted to um, sort of entice you to maybe come on some of the RBA trips where we feature looking at these birds. Starting once again in the upper left, we have the chestnut-sided warbler which is a visitor here, um, occasionally nests, but most of the time is just passing through in now the month of May. Then the bobolink, which is a nester, but not in the Rochester area, at some points further south, generally farmland. And uh, the long-tailed duck has been with us since October, but it's now leaving more or less. It's a winter visiting. For, for them, the Rochester area is like the Riviera because they nest up in the Arctic Circle. Okay, so they're down here for the warmth, okay, believe it or not. And then finally there's the green heron, which is a pretty common bird around here, but a very elusive. 
exclusive. So, um, what I wanted to do was, with that, I showed you 12 birds. Well, they're actually closer to 300 birds that are in the Rochester area. Is my mic still working? Okay. All right. So, the, the, the bird list, the checklist that the RBA has, that's one, that's two pages of it. This is the other two pages of it. It lists 285 birds that are seen in our area, okay? So that is a very rich list. If you go to other places, they're generally around the low 200s or so. But um, my wife and I, who are more or less casual birders, will regularly see 200 different species of birds during the year. So it's a very rich area in terms of birding. And the reason for that is uh, you have uh, Lake Ontario, and you also have the fact that we're on the Eastern Flyway for migration. And in addition to that, within 30 minutes of Rochester, you have a variety of different habitats that other places would be hard to come up with. And so uh, that accounts for the number of birds that we have in, in the area. Uh, in addition to that, uh, right now, um, there are two organizations that make use of the flyway and the migration, and those are the ones listed up there now. Uh, Braddock Bay Birding Observatory, which I encourage you to try and uh, visit this year. They're gonna be starting up in just a few weeks and they're banding birds uh, that are migrating through the area, catching and banding them. And also the uh, Braddock Bay Raptor Research, and those folks in particular, their bander has been counting birds since the 1st of April, okay? Um, two weeks ago, he had 20,000 turkey vultures in one day. So that, that's pretty impressive. I looked at that and I said, did he put in an extra zero? But then I looked at the Hamburg uh, Hawk Watch and they had the, about the same number of birds. So while I'm on the subject of turkey vultures, you, you have heard about the incident at the airport where there was a turkey vulture that came in with a raccoon under each, a dead raccoon under each wing. And they refused to check them in because you're only allowed one carrier. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, one, one thing you notice about, uh, there's, uh, these are all common names that are listed there. And most of the time the name consists of two parts. Usually there's an adjective and then there's the name of the species. So for instance, you'll have a lot of sparrows, and there'll be chipping sparrows, and song sparrows, and swamp sparrows. And, uh, but there are other birds there that only have one name, like osprey, like buffalo head. You know? So sometimes that rule isn't uh, obeyed. But uh, the problem with using The problem with using common names is that um, they change depending on whether they want you to buy a new bird book or not. Okay, that's, that's one reason for it. And the other thing is that places will, uh, the, the community in the U.S. will actually change the name. So in my time birding, I've gone from the Baltimore Oriole to the Northern Oriole and back to the Baltimore. We recently had the gray jay, which is common in the Adirondacks, right, change to the Canada jay. So those names change depending on how this organization feels about it. Um, the other thing is, if you go to another country, the birds are referred to differently also. Like our loon in Great Britain is referred to as a diver. Our cormorant is a shag. So, 
Now, one thing that doesn't change is the Latin name for the bird. But we don't really want, I, I don't really want to be in trouble trying to learn the Latin names for the birds. But those are generally agreed upon worldwide. Maybe enough about names and how do we actually do this? So we rely on our senses in order to identify the birds. And the two that we most heavily rely on are sight. And we'll cover that one first. Our eye is uh, unique in its ability to detect movement. Not necessarily color, but if we focus on a patch of woods, with a 90 degree field, 90 degree field of view, here goes my water. 90 degree field of view, you can, you can readily take that if there's anything moving in that area. Okay. And that's a really valuable because birds move around, and what you're doing is you're looking for things that are moving. So, um, Things to key on, though, are relative size. So, for instance, if we have an American crow, we can distinguish that from a black-capped chickadee just on the basis of size. There's also a difference in coloration in the two. And likewise, if we have a blue jay versus a cardinal, we have different colors. Okay. Now, things become a little harder when you have two birds that are both yellow. What we rely on in that case is our field marks. So we're looking at details in terms of the appearance of the bird. So for instance, thank you. Thank you very much. So in the case of the, uh, of the goldfinch, we have the black wings and the black uh, forehead. In the case of the uh, yellow warbler on the right, we have a delicate uh, patterning on the wings. Now, two birds that are both blue, but the blue jay doesn't have any color associated with it. It's blue, black, and white. Eastern bluebird, our state bird, has this orange, at least the male anyway, has this orange uh, chest. Now things get a little diff more difficult when we get to the woodpeckers, and this is something that stumps, at least for a while, even experienced birders looking at two woodpeckers in the tree and wondering which one you're looking at. Is it the downy woodpecker, which is slightly smaller than the hairy woodpecker? So that's one thing, but judging, judging size is difficult, and you never have the two of them together, or hardly ever. But you, in this case, what we're looking for is the size of the beak. And if you look at the hairy woodpecker, it's a much longer beak. So all of these things, all of these field marks that I'm talking about demand that you have a, a bigger view of the bird than what you get with your eyes. And now we come to, that's the reason why we have binoculars. So what the binoculars do is it'll take something like the tree on the right, and if you'll notice there's a square in yellow. So that's what you see with your eye, and you can detect whether there's something moving there. And so we isolate that with the binoculars, we take that little square, which is now on your left, and we magnify it eightfold so that that bird is now just not a small silhouette, but it's something reasonable in terms of size, like a quarter of your field of view, so that you can actually see some of the field marks associated with the bird. So it's a combination of the two, using your sight to detect the bird, and then keying in on the bird with the binoculars. And this is, a, there's a skill issue associated with this too. Um, so first, before I get to that, some details about binoculars. So 
The two versions of binoculars that you're most likely to see are Coro and roof prism binoculars. And there's no choose, it's a personal preference which one you pick. The Coro prism has been around a long time. Most of the new binoculars are roof prism binoculars. Myself, I get along better with the roof prism binoculars than always have. And we'll get to that in a minute. In terms of the parts of the binoculars, the one thing that I point out here is um, most of the time the binoculars come with a neck strap. You want to put the neck strap on before you do anything else with the binoculars. And the reason for this is you could find yourself maybe sometime on, a, on an ocean cruise, on a pitching boat, and someone says, oh, that albatross is pretty close, you want to take a look, and he hands you the binoculars. You want to put that strap on before the boat pitches and you send his $3,000 binoculars overboard. You might have an issue with that. So the other thing is, with the neck strap, you always know where the binoculars are. You don't know where they are, they're right, they're right underneath you. So the interesting or the essential adjustments are whether you're wearing glasses or not. So if you're, the binoculars are designed so that the objective lens of the binoculars, the lens that's closest to your eye, is a certain distance away from your retina. And if you're wearing glasses, that distance increases because of the distance of the glasses. So what you have to do is, on the binoculars, that's Doug Smith. <laughs> Hi, Doug. <laughs> so what you want to do with, uh, if you're wearing glasses, is to turn down those eye cups so that you can get closer to them and get a good feel of you. Otherwise, you're looking something like soda straws, you'll be looking at a small one. So that's one thing. The second thing is to adjust for the fact that your eyes are different in terms of their inner pupil every distance. So the binoculars all come that they have a hinge in the middle, and you simply move that hinge in and out until you see a nice bright image. Okay, one image, one circle. Now the hard part is this part. So you see a bird in the distance with your eyes. And the trick is, don't move your head. Keep your eyes right there. Reach out for your binoculars and put them up to your eyes. Okay? And you should be looking at the same area you were looking at with your eyes. Do not try and interrogate the entire tree for the bird, because you will spend a lot of time. So, going back to the diagram that I showed you before, in the square, you have a bird that's moving. So, you raise the binoculars, and what you're looking for is, is the field of view that I'm looking at in my binoculars, what I was seeing when I was using my eyes. If it wasn't, put down the binoculars, fix your head again, raise the binoculars up. Okay? Does that make sense, people? Don't try and look through the whole tree, because at the rate, at eight power, you would probably take the better part of a half an hour to look through the tree. And the other thing is, the bird may have flown, but they do have wings. So there is a skill issue associated with this, and I have been with birders that are just absolutely remarkable in terms of doing that. Like one-handed, with the scope over their other shoulder, and be able to key on birds that someone just says, oh, it's over there. And it's a skill that you, that you develop with repeated use. Uh, now the second thing is, if you're out with a group, and let's say you have the good fortune to find a bird, how do you describe where that bird is? So 
the trick that we use is if it's a tree, you try and get everyone to be looking at the same tree and then treat the tree as you would the face of a clock and tell them, okay, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, toward the edge of the tree, toward the middle of the tree, and that way you give them some kind of a good idea of where the bird actually is instead of pointing, which is next to worthless. Um, so, and it's not just trees we're talking about either, it could be posts or buildings, but you can use the same kind of tricks. Try and be uh, descriptive so that you're, you don't frustrate people with you having found the only chestnut-sided warbler and everybody else wondering where the hell it is. Now, the other uh, sense that we use is sound. And that becomes progressively more important as the season goes on. And I think it's mostly related to these troublesome things that come out on the trees, right, called leaves. Because they hide the birds so that we can't see them. But if they are singing, we can locate them by sound, get a general idea of where they are, and then focus our eyes on that area, and hopefully they'll pop out and let us see them. The birds all have unique, for the most part, calls or songs. And I was going to play some for you, and this is, this is, uh, to be an experiment here because most of the time I'm working with a much smaller group, much closer to me, <laughs> and uh, what I'm going to do is be playing them using a cheesy audio recorder through a Fitbit that I'm going to hold up to the microphone. Okay? So, bear with me. Uh, but these are the birds that I'll be, um, that I'll be dealing with. So, black cat chicken. That is not a bird call. <laughs> it's a phone call. We're gonna wait, we're gonna wait for that to go away. <laughs> He's 
Eastern Screech Owl, and this is for the night hawk, the night hawk, uh, night owls. You know.
isn't so much except as reflected off of you. So, okay. So um, the thing that I leave you with is, what would be if if you're just starting early? What would be a reasonable um, thing to do in terms of an objective? If you have the access to the word list from the Righteous Reporting Association. You, you don't want to see that. Start out trying to look for a hundred birds. But what I propose is maybe you look for two dozen. And what I've done here is I've gone through the list and I've picked two dozen birds, some of which are here in summer, some of which are here in winter, some of which are only here uh, some of which are here all the time, okay? And for extra credit, if you can identify both male and female. So in this list, for instance, I do have a pointer.
obviously, because I, I wasn't sure. Um, I, it was with some trepidation that I approached the speaking here because when Bruce talked to me, he said, oh, well, you talked to the men. But I didn't know it was going to be a nice kind of auditorium. I could hear there had been a thousand people in this room. So it was a little less. The other thing that I'd give you with this, leave you with is the URL of the Rochester Birding Association, which has most of it, most if not all of its website open to the public. So you can find out areas, you know, to go and bird, and also all the trips that are coming up and what likely we're going to see. So now what I thought I'd do is just tell you my motivations for birding, okay? And I just, I wrote these down over the period of a year. So for me, there's a social aspect associated with birding. There's a competition thing, you know? When I'm out with other people, can I see the bird first? Can I get a better look at it than they can? Can I count more birds than they do in a day, week, month? And it, it's, Birding is kind of like hunting. You, know, you might know the bird is there, but you haven't got a look at him. And do I want to go left or right, or do I want to stay where I am? Kind of that same sort of thing that hunters do. There's a skill building. I mentioned the business about binoculars and the use of binoculars and getting better at that. And also being able to tell different species of birds by field work, so you have to do some studying of the types. It's a gentle physical activity. It's uh, sort of like golf, you know, maybe not as physically active, but um, there's uh, enjoying nature, just being out in it, that is, uh, has been demonstrated to have some positive effect on our well being. Um, and um, then there's the business about just uh, as you bird regularly seeing the seasons go by. So you, you could come up with tests where you would throw three birds at an experienced bird species, and he'd be able to tell you which month it was. Because yeah. there are some that are mutually exclusive. Um, there's the uh, motivation to travel to see new birds. Both in this country, you know, that, I mean, going to Niagara Falls is interesting in winter when you can see 12 species of gulls if you get there on the way to But then there are other places that are um, a, little, a little more comfortable to go to, like Florida and Arizona, California, <laughs> uh, that, have their, that have their own birds, and you have to, you have to learn those birds, and that's intellectually stimulating. Then there are a host of other countries that have, particularly the ones south of us, that have far more birds than we do. Um, then uh, building your skill at identifying birds through study. Um, then, if you're curious, uh, just the natural history of birds. How did they come to be? Um, what are their life cycles like? How's one bird different than another? Why is this bird doing what it's doing? So there's a lot of uh, that, those questions that you can ask to get into um, books that will give you some of those answers. And then there's always a better view of a bird. So no matter how many times you've seen a bird, there's always an opportunity where you will see that bird in different light, under different conditions that will impress you, for sure. So you just work toward that. And then the be becoming a better citizen, just you get an appreciation for the natural habitat and what's happening to it, and uh, maybe what should be done or isn't being done. And, uh, in that uh, vein, there are citizen science type of activities that you can be in, like um, in Christmas, around Christmas, we do a bird count of our area. As a matter of fact, there are several of them. There's one in Rochester 
that my wife has um, the counter for, and that has been going on for 107 years. It's the second oldest in the country. So there are those opportunities. And there's one in Finger Lakes, there's one in Ledger, there's one out in the Huntsville area. So there are opportunities for you to participate. That information is used and valued as a resource by people doing environmental and finally, there's a teaching opportunity, uh, which I am making use of right now, right? <laughs> so, and the ability to just get other people excited about birding and passing along, and so So, that's what I had for you. So I will entertain questions or comments. I always have a hard time distinguishing Ravens and crows? Ravens and crows. Yeah. Okay. Ravens and crows. Both big black birds. <laughs> I, what you want to do is pay attention to the tail. The tail of the two birds is different. The, the crow has, the end of its tail is sort of just squared off. In the case of the raven, You can see that. The other thing is the voice of the raven is different than the crow. Okay. Now to complicate matters in the Rochester area, we also have fish crow, <laughs> which are virtually indistinguishable from the American crow. Okay. But the only way you can tell them apart for us is, is by voice. So the fish crow generally is a two-part song, kind of like ha, 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 ha. And the crow is just eh, eh, like that. Okay. Other? Um, have you ever used or do you know anybody that's used that new app that's supposed to? I can't hear. Oh. You, have you ever used or do you know anybody that's used that new app that you put up and it listens to the bird sound and, and plays it or, or tells you what the bird is? It's, I, it's a Merlin app. I, it's hope. I think it's. Is it Berlin? Berlin, yeah, with okay. Cornell. I, I have not used that, but I've heard really good things about it. It's great. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good thing. I, I, I think, if, if, unless I'm mistaken, though, they want a little bit more information than just that call. They want to know where you are. So that you generally have to give your location in the country so that they can then, yeah, I believe that's the case. Right, and the best part is if you participate on that app and you identify where you are in the world, they document that data, and that will go into this massive database where they start tracking bird migrations and bird um, increase in population, or unfortunately the sad decline that's happening worldwide with birds. But yeah. Merlin is really fun. It gets to be controversial. Um, a diehard birder might say, you shouldn't be playing the sounds and calling the birds into you. It could be disruptive to nature. On the other hand, there's the aspect of if you want to start to identify a bird and then teach someone else, it's, it's a perfect way to do it. I, I didn't think there was, uh, Merlin does not play the call for you. You record it and then it identifies yes. it, right? Yes, but you so, can... So that, that business of playing like the calls that I was uh, playing right here, uh, certain times of the year you should not be doing that right. because it interferes with their breeding. Right. You know, you might chase a bird off of a nest or draw something off of a nest, make the nest more vulnerable to predators. And that isn't what you want. Or you could, in, in the middle of winter, you could stress birds. Unnecessary. So, your points are all well taken. Thank you. Again. <laughs> I believe bottlenecks are bringing in lots of bottlenecks. Bottlenecks. Bottlenecks right now or? Um, during the summer. Yes. Yeah. I, I would. I would think so. I think you have to find the appropriate field to do that. But I think Avon area is also pretty good. For but all, like, like this uh, woman in back has said, we suffered like something like a 30% uh, 
uh, decline in uh, some bird population over the last 20 years. So serious stuff is happening. A lot of it relates to insect life and what we're doing in terms of agriculture. So, but that's all another topic. Yes? I'm wondering about promoting uh, nesting sites. Uh, we have robins who regularly build nests on the front of our house. Yeah. They try to build them in a wreath, and the, <laughs> the lamps beside the door. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then another, and the lamps beside the garage. But often the eggs are stolen. They, oh. they don't mature. Uh -huh. Yeah, do you know who's, what's happening to the eggs? Is it uh, raccoons or? I don't know. Would they be able to get a, a, a light that's up high? I don't know. They maybe go at it from the roof. I, I don't know myself. But I have not figured out. I, I don't know how to. You, robins are um, adaptable in terms of where they nest, but also often it's a man made structure. And, uh, you know, I, I run into them, they nest in my gutter, you know, just before the first big thunderstorm we have, and that's, that's toast. So, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. How, uh, house fish are sort of the same way. And we had uh, Carolina Wren on our front porch in a uh, container uh, next to our doorway. So we couldn't use our front porch for a month. <laughs> well, there's, there's, um, yeah, excrement associated with the nest. Yeah. But it, at least it isn't a bald eagle or a turkey vulture. <laughs> that would be worse. <laughs> See you at the 